So early pianos and modern minds, that seems like a fairly strange combination. After some of the talks that we've heard, I'm sure some of you are wondering, well, well, you know, why would we be interested in that? Let me see if I can bring some things together. So I will start by saying that Dr. Edge, who was our first speaker uh, this morning, was also my physics professor 40 years ago. We had a chance encounter in his office where he had built a clavichord. And the whole encounter, if it lasted 30 minutes, that would have been pretty generous. But it changed my life because when I heard that instrument and I sat down and played just a little bit on that instrument in his office, in my mind I was going, man, this, this is just blowing my mind. I need to get back to this sound some way, shape, or form. And sure enough, I did. Um, I also recall that, uh, that Dr. Edge strongly discouraged me from going into either science or music. <laughs> so I joined the elite company of Watson and Crick with, <laughs> with having been warned off the property. We will, uh, we will uh, draw a curtain of charity over the rest of that and say it has been a very good career. I could talk about these medical devices uh, that uh, I think are so important. But let me talk about something else that I'm doing that I think perhaps you will find uh, equally enjoyable. So what happens when the modern mind comes together with the early piano? Now the modern mind in this case, we take the, this piano collection, we use it with uh, students from all over the area, certainly all over the upstate, but they come from Columbia, they come from Brevard, Georgia, Charlotte, and they come to, to find out what, you know, I, I, historically informed keyboard practice might look like. And invariably, their first moments look something like this. You know, it's an elephant in front of the piano, smashing down on the keys willy-nilly. Why is that? And I thought the why is that might be more interesting today than talking a whole lot about early pianos. So I, I began to think about that. Why is that? So this is something that, that many of the speakers have already touched on today, working memory. Your working memory, if you are an average to smart person, you can hold four disparate things in your head at one time. If you're really good, you might be able to hold five. If you're really kind of a dunce, you might be able to hold three, but probably not, not fewer than three. So this is something that all of us, all of us, modern minds, early minds, any minds, have to contend with. We have to contend with the fact that we can't keep it all in our heads at one time. So the information that you can hold in your mind at one time is the information that you can interrelate. That's the stuff that the information that you can take and make some sort of sense out of and then convey back out to the rest of the world. What does that mean? It means that we constantly look for ways to reduce, to abstract the information and the content to meaningful levels, and then later we re-expand it, we synthesize it back out to something that we, we can recall and perhaps we can use. So history, for instance, becomes a series of simplified names and dates divorced from all period context and yet clothed in certainty on recall. Now you're going to come right back to me and going to say, Tom, what are you talking about? History is long-term memory. History, there's mountains of history out there. Yes, you're absolutely right. There's mountains of history out there. But when you're standing up in front of an audience, when you're performing, you have, you have quite a number of tasks in front of you right away. You're dealing with the light. You're dealing with all the faces. You're trying to make some level of impression while you're standing here. You're starting to really task the amount of working memory that you have. If I call on you then to do something that is completely outside of your kinetic memory, outside of your field, like play an early piano, one of the first things that happens is that, that you crash and burn. It is wildly interesting to me that when the eight-year-olds come to the collection and they play, they are fearless. They're fearless because they're not working on all this other stuff. They don't care about the lights. They don't care about the other people. Oh, you want me to play this? Boom, 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 and out comes Clementi in the most beautiful way that you can imagine. Take a 14-year-old who has been through many, many more years and has almost got a national presence, put him in front of the same piano, and they say, I can't play this. I wouldn't know what to do with this. Here's a fellow that everyone in the room would say, I know this person, all right? 
of Abe Lincoln. I can call up several things about Abe Lincoln. I can, you know, four score and 20 years ago and, and you know, uh, freed the slaves and et cetera. What happens when we just do that? All of a sudden, Lincoln becomes alarmingly alive. He's actually coming back in front of you here and, and much more of a modern context. This is one of the things that these early pianos do is they bring back to life a sound and a sensation that the composer knew that most of us never ever hear again. So, an example. Here is 1791 Broadwood Grand. This is one of the earliest working grand, uh, English grand pianos uh, uh, left in the world. Uh, it's one of the gems of the collection and, and everybody comes and uses it and plays it. Uh, it's in very, very good shape. It, uh, it's been restored. I, I, I took care of that. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's really set so that, that, you know, everybody pretty much agrees, yes, Tom, that's the way they were. You've got it set. Here's uh, uh, Franz Joseph Haydn. Haydn had one of these 1791 grand pianos. When he came to London, during his, quote, London period, and when he was composing. So what happens when you take Haydn, say the E-flat major uh, sonata, and you play it on the 1791 Broadwood that he knew that, in fact, he's using to actually compose this thing. Well, you get, you get some very uh, startling results. So here is uh, Melvina, Melvina Kurosha, uh, 17 years old. She's one of the, uh, the premier young up-and-coming pianists. She's been uh, on the uh, NPR radio show on the top. She has, uh, she's come to our house and, and recorded for another uh, NPR radio show uh, you know, using, as it turns out, the 1791 Broadwood. Here she is in front of uh, her piano, uh, a concert uh, grand uh, Model D Steinway. So here's Melvina at the 1791 Broadwood Grand, and she's playing along, and she's really struggling through some of the passages. The repeats don't repeat as fast as she's used to. When she really plays hard, one of the things that happens with an, an antique instrument, an early keyboard, is that, that it'll actually stop responding. It'll even go backwards a little bit. If you try to smash hard enough willy-nilly across the keys, what will happen is this, the, the, the sound will actually come down because it's kind of blurring and getting very, very nasty and noisy. So she's going through the corrections that you have to go through to learn how to make this instrument sound like somebody at her level of expertise is actually making into beautiful music. And as she matured through this during the day, you know, I asked Melvina, well, you know, what have you learned? And of course she came back with, well, I've learned that on this piano you know, that Haydn knew I have to, to uh, play these uh, trills much slower and, and I have to you know, really watch the dynamics. I have a feeling, guys, that what she said when she left was, boy, I sure am glad I got my modern piano so that I can really play this thing and, and get something out of it. Can you imagine what it's like when they get in front of a harpsichord? So here's a Flemish-style harpsichord that I built 30 years ago in response to Dr. Edge's challenge of the clavichord, and then uh, one of the finest uh, uh, English uh, antique harpsichords that exists that's also in the collection. Uh, marvelous instruments, uh, instruments known to, to Bach and, and uh, you know, certainly you know, the young Mozart. And for these you know, well-trained keyboard artists, these things become you know, something of a sticky wicket. And they have to work hard through it. We have a lot of pianos in the collection to show the full, broad spectrum of what was going on back in the 18th century. And, and by the way, these are not composers that are forgotten. You guys have heard of Mozart before. You've heard of Haydn. You've certainly heard of Bach and Beethoven. They never heard of Steinway, for what it's worth. So uh, lifting one advertisement from uh, a New Orleans newspaper, you find three pianos for sale that are about as disparate as they can, can be. The William Geib over here, a bicord uh, square piano, the Stein Viennese action, and then this uh, giraffe piano, which is a thing unto itself. In fact, in the 1830 to 1835 time period, there was the greatest diversity of acoustic piano sounds ever produced. 
ever produced. But we were moving toward a more single sound. And we were doing that because we were listening to a few voices, and those few voices were saying, you know, let's, let's make it louder, let's make it faster. Liszt, you know, began to lead the way, and Liszt's style was very compelling and sexual for the time. And people really wanted to sound like that. And then uh, Anton Rubinstein pretty much sealed the deal. America, America was a wonderful, innovative country, and, and we worked very, very rapidly not only to catch up with what was going on in Europe, but to surpass it. So by 1860, we have surpassed everything that's going on, and we come forward with pianos that pretty much all sound alike. And they are very loud, and, they, and you can play very quickly on them. And the modern piano was born. And so, you know, for those of us who study early keyboards, 1860 is kind of the cutoff. Anything after 1860, and we consider a modern piano. I have a, a chronic and Bach of 1904, and I consider that the modern piano in the house and everything else from before. So, here's diversity that you saw in uh, 1830 to 1835. Here is uh, three pianos from the collection. And, uh, you know, let's just look real quickly uh, at just a few numbers. Here's the touch response. The touch response means how far down does the key go when I touch it. And look what happens. So, the, the nuns here at only about four and a half millimeters compared to a Steinway at a full eight millimeters, everybody else in between. When you look at the effort response, how much effort does it take to get that same amount of impulse energy? You find that, that when, you, when you put the effort out, the guide here is only going to give you about uh, you know, 60 newtons, the, the rouse somewhere in between. The nuns and the Steinway, very, very similar because the nuns is an American piano and we're on the move and we're going to make this thing happen. And of course, by 1860, Steinway is, is leading the world both in marketing and in sound. So, we were pushing very hard toward it, but we were very tolerant 160 years ago of a wide variety of sounds. And our composers knew a wide variety of sounds. This is diversity in 2014. Um, you know, they, <laughs> there's not a lick of difference between them. Now, where does this all tie together? So, here we are, uh, you know, with, with sort of a single sound, and we have it because, quite frankly, we struggle to keep a whole bunch of different things in our head at once. So, when these young people come up through the ranks, through the competitions, they're taught to play in one particular way to impress the judges. And if you try to take, the, take nuance and sensitivity and throw it in, well, that may not be exactly what they're looking for. So what we've done is we've consolidated and we've brought everything together into a kind of a, a common one. And what I want you to think about is that every piece of information that you gather from your friends, from your internet, from your teachers, has all been filtered through a mind that could hold four things at once. And so it's been, it's been abstracted and it's been synthesized. If you want to find out what was really going on, sometimes you have to go back to the original source. You see here, you know, Melvina as the example that, uh, you know, when she came in front of the original source, she had to change what she was doing. Can you imagine how the rest of history must look if we can go back to the original sources and question what did it mean and why was it there? And that is what I wanted to leave you with today. And so I will say uh, a thank you. And if you are in the upstate area and would like to visit the collection, uh, we have, it's insane, we have 18 pianos and four harpsichords, various clavichords. Come and hear the 18th century speak back to you again, because I think it's fairly compelling. Thank you very much.